Hello everyone, welcome back to the channel, best place for long-term stock investors. As you can see today, thanks to the EMCO, we are doing things, we are doing the quick dive at home. So let's just uh, get right to it. Three companies we're going to talk about today. Uh, number one is Genetech, right? The stock price went up a lot. What's going on? The second thing is K-Power. A lot of you in the comment section of our previous server videos actually asked us to comment on K-Power. So today we're going to give our thoughts on K-Power. And then last, we're going to talk about probably one of the biggest IPO uh, in Malaysian history, right? Uh, it's not the biggest, but it's very significant. It's a company called CTOS. So we're going to share with you whether it's worth subscribing or not. By the way, if you're eager to start your journey towards building a six to seven figure portfolio, we've got a free training lineup for you and you can find that free training in the links below. All right, John. So uh, first stock, it's a Genetech, right? Yep. So I believe the stock was uh, only, let me see, uh, over the past bucks, year, just in 2020, right? Not even a year, it was at like two bucks, 170, 180. And then today it's uh, nearly touching uh, 16. Yeah. It's up like eight times, right? So I guess, you know, maybe just share with us what what is uh Genetech from your point of view? Uh it's an automation uh, solutions provider. Uh, their focus is mainly towards hard disks in the beginning. And they are starting uh I think they started to switch towards uh, automotives and EVs, uh, I think in the late tw- 2012. I think 2011 was pretty interesting for them because um, what what happened was that in 2011, they had an acquisition of a a US-based company. Uh, And because of that, when they they acquired, in came the revenues and it jumped significantly. And if you can see um, what I'm showing on my screen right now, um, 2010 to 2011, uh, the revenue actually jumped double, more than double. uh. Wow. I think... Uh, a lot of um, enthusiasm is also because of this uh, recent contract. Um, they they just recently announced that they secured forty seven point nine million worth of contracts in two areas, which is their focus. Uh, the first one is forty two point five million in their electric vehicle and batteries. They don't make the electric vehicles and batteries, but they build the assembly lines to make them. Okay. And then for hard disk and semiconductor, it's about five point four. So all in forty seven point nine which is 50% of their current trading yes. month's revenue. Right now, yeah. they're about 100, right? Yeah, yeah, correct. So I think that that's where the hype is coming from. Uh, for those, I think some, some of our viewers may, be, um, may not be familiar with how an automation line looks like. So I'll just quickly show, this is how an assembly line looks like. There's tons of robots right. uh, you know, at the side, and then you, you go through like a very long conveyor system, a line. And um, the intelligent assembly system in which Genetech makes is like, it's just this long assembly line that as the car passes through, the chassis passes through, then these different different parts come, come into play. La. I think, yeah. So it, they've been struggling, MJ. I think uh, in terms of margins, no way close to it. Uh, most of the ATE guys like Vitrox or, or me or whatsoever, I think gross was is only about 20, 20%, 30%. I think right. it peaked. Yeah. So I think, what drove the enthusiasm mainly was probably the contract secured, but limit up eight, you know, to eight times the price. I think that's pretty interesting. Uh. <laughs> like, do you think the areas they're exposed to is exciting? And also, like, is it, it, it looks to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, they are in a business where quite a lot of other people can do, right? It's not very specialized. Am I right to say that? Yeah, I think that that shows in their historical numbers as well. They've been ups and downs, very cyclical uh, in terms of their revenue and profit generation. Uh, They even have to write down their US uh, uh, purchase in 2011 in 2013. So they bought it in 2011. Right. uh, And then in 2013, they wrote off completely about 22 million, if I'm not mistaken. uh, Yeah, that's why they had a loss, right? Uh, In 2013, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, what's also interesting, MJ, was that they just turned net cash this year. Yeah. So, so I, I guess a combined, uh, um, a, a few uh, catalysts, I would say. One is the securing of contract. Secondly, is the, the turning into a net cash company. And as you rightly pointed out, it's 
it's a quite a little bit of a low barriers to entry because I wouldn't say that they it's like everybody can jump on the bandwagon and start doing right. automation line, but I'm saying that it's like there's a lot of players with capabilities that can be built pretty quickly. I mean, great great hack uh is con- I would consider them almost like a competitor because they also manufacture automation lines for the electric vehicle space. So, you know, interesting to watch going forward. Yeah, I think what I find interesting is that Although they, they don't look profitable accounting wise, mm-hmm. uh, actually they're generating pretty decent cash. That's right. That's pretty right. decent cash, right? And so if their cash grows fifty percent a year, right now they are trading at nearly eight hundred million ringgit in market cap. So that's about mm-hmm. seven hundred eighty. Yeah. So they have uh twenty nearly let's call it twenty five million or twenty million in cash flows the previous year. Uh, trading twelve months. Sorry. Yeah. So if it grows fifty percent, that number in the future becomes about thirty. So thirty on eight hundred, I believe that's a twenty. Uh, it's a mount that it has multiple figures in terms of its uh, <clears throat> its PE. So do yeah. you think that's justified? Um, I I think for people who pay up for price going into the future, you must be very aware of the risk, lah. Uh, ju- justify, you know, it really boils down to the appetite of the investor. I would say. You know, remember we had this discussion with Peter and, and and he said that one of the mistakes he made was really paying up for high valuations. Yeah. Uh, looking towards the future. I, I'm not saying I, I, I'm in alignment with him. It's not right or wrong. But I think investors should be very aware that when you're paying for forward PE, and uh, you, you must be very well yeah. aware of the risk <clears throat> as well. Uh. And you know, the calculation I just did is basically, just, it's based on operating cash flow, right? But, as an investor, it's it's the future free cash flow that counts. Correct. So I think just one last question on this uh, company is that it looks to me like a pretty capex intensive, yeah, business. Am I right yes. to say that? Yeah, yeah. It, uh, uh, okay. Yes and no. In the sense that, I think the capex intensity is when they acquire the raw materials to right. actually build those lines. But then when it turns over, they they don't burden themselves with the holding of this uh, uh, this equipment lah. so it's kind of like asset light uh, you don't need you don't need a lot of light, like Vitrox and the Mies and any of the ATE guys right you don't need capex intensive machinery to build the machines but the holding cost while you're building and I think they give quite a good indication MJ it was between uh, 6 to 9 months for them to build a line so right. that, that, that turnaround cycle I think uh, makes it less capex intensive as compared to if we were to compare let's say for an oil and gas guy like Yinsen and all that, that kind of thing yeah <clears> they, <throat> of they, they don't need to be asset heavy so it seems to me that um, let's say uh, if for every dollar of operating cash flow they keep let, let, let's say if you normalize it right they don't they don't spend too much it's can they keep like half at least probably yeah I, I, I would presume so I would okay. yeah yeah okay that's still, in my view, slightly pricey, but uh, I could be wrong. So, yeah, correct. Uh, any any last uh, points that you want to make? Uh, I think the, the the last point is that um, what what really piqued my interest when I was researching them was uh, their geographical turnover uh, by location, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, switch quite drastically from uh, Malaysia thirty four percent in twenty nineteen to being Europe as the main contributor 40% in 2020. That's so it's like, Yeah, so it was like Malaysia 34% 2019 and then now it's like 13% and then all of a sudden, poop, go to Europe in 2020, 40%, you know, and Europe in 2019 was like nowhere. <laughs> so That's interesting. Yeah, so they're opening up new barriers, uh, new, new, new geographical locations to grow <laughs> revenue and I think kudos to the, to the company for doing so. And yeah, I'll be interested to see how, how they justify the current price uh, increase substantially over, over the next few uh, years. Uh. Okay. All right. So that's that's it uh, that we have for Genetech. Moving on. Okay, guys, before we move on, just want to let you know, we are actually receiving, uh, we are open to receiving actually some of the research reports that you guys are writing. Uh, and if you want a free review as to whether or not your thesis or your investment makes sense, just email us a Google Doc or a Google Sheets or both, right? And the email is hello at fire.co, H-E-L-L-O at 
www.firl.co or you can get the full email in the description and comments. Okay, uh, next. K-Power, right guys, everyone is talking about it. Thanks to Serba Dynamic, I believe Karim, which is the shareholder, largest shareholder of Serba Dynamic, owns about 10% of uh, K-Power. And just because of that name association, uh, K-Power got shot down. Now today we are going to dig into like why K-Power uh, might be a little bit different. But basically, thanks to that association with Karim, the stock went down as far as almost 60%. Uh, actually more than 60%. So yeah, John, um, basically I want to start off by saying that uh, if you look on the slides, right, uh, basically mm. what K-Power does is that it's an EPCC, right? it's a construction company Correct. for more renewable type of uh, energy. So like if you look uh, on the slides, uh, in Malaysia you have, you know, uh, Okay, excluding the sewage power, uh, sewage treatment plant, you have like hydropower plants, you have uh, solar power. So when you go to Nepal, it's the same thing, right? Nepal is like close to the mountain, so hydro uh, is a big thing. And uh, Indonesia, you know, you've got hydropower. So basically, they just build it and then that's it. It's, 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 it's actually what, ironically, Serba wants to get into uh, that's right. right now. That's right. And that is the current order book. And if you look at the tender book, so this tender is basically what they might win. So Correct. right now, the if you look on the slides, the total order book outstanding is about two billion. So they are due to get two billion over a specific period of time. Yeah. Uh, usually, an average of three to four uh, years. Yes. Yeah. And then uh, the what the bottom half uh, that is the total bid. So this four point two three billion is what they could get. And no surprise, just like Saba, a big chunk of it will be coming from the Middle East. No, could be coming from the Middle East. They have not gotten it. Although what I find interesting when I look across this uh, bit is that the Middle East one um, has 60% infrastructure, whereas the rest, when you look at Malaysia, Indonesia, Nepal, and Laos, uh, mostly is in you know energy related. So John, what are your thoughts on K-Power? Um... Infrastructure is slightly less technical as compared to energy um, mm -hmm. because the expertise required to build um, hydroelectric plants versus roads or, or highways, right, is much simpler. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, no, sorry, hydro is being more technically challenging and roads much simpler. What, what's interesting was that if you look back at how fast they grew, you know, uh, they, there's always this talk on the market called the Karim Midas Touch, uh. <laughs> the moment it came in, boom, revenue just, you know, I was just joking with uh, our researchers group, uh, MJ, remember? That's Netflix right. growth, man. <laughs> Netflix <Yep>. growth. <laughs> um, I think what makes them stand a little bit better in terms of uh, financials, I, I, I guess they collect, they're better at their collection. Yeah. In terms of their receivables uh, and also their operating cash flow, they're much better than Serba. Uh what remains to be seen is that because of this association with Karim and their big uh, push towards EPCC uh, is that how can they continuously win these contracts? Uh? Because, right. yeah, I mean, while their uh, order book is about $2 billion, the, the struggle of any EPCC contractor is this, uh, MJ. It's not like the MFCBs of this world or, or, or any concessions uh, where you only get revenue from construction that means every time you want to bring in more sales you just have to fight for contracts fight for contracts That's it's, right. it's, it's a very tiring game right uh i think investors if you want to look for something more longer term uh the recurring cash flow is not as stable as those with concessions i think that that's my thought process i mean epcc contractors one yes, uh, if you become you build a re uh, name for yourself you build a reputation right uh, the likelihood of the contracts going to you is higher but even then, um, there's so many other factors or variables that are in play. I mean, I was into this space for 10 years. Every time we write tender specs or, or specifications for our skit, right? The usual suspects will turn up. But even then, it's always competitive bidding because there's a very stringent tender requirement that you need to be transparent and open. And if, if, if in any likely case, they can still continue to grow, right? They'll hit rate. There's this, there's this term called hit rate, which is like you bid for 100 million worth of contract. If your hit rate is 20%, it means you're only going to get 20 right. million, right? 
I don't know. I, I don't know whether you've looked at that uh, uh MJ on their hit rate. Is it? Uh, is I'm it not. The but range? I do know the industry average is about where you say it is twenty to thirty percent. Yeah, yeah. So I think a lot of times people look at, wow, their bid is this big, right? But then you just have to average it out. What's their hit rate, lah? And then then you can have some sort of a rough indication of what is their outstanding order book, lah. It yeah, so that forward, leads uh. me into a very uh, interesting point, which is the valuations, right? Because Correct. I think that as with any EPCC companies, there's going to be a risk of uh, either failed bids or uh, cash flow dragging. Um, you know, a lot of K-powers uh, receivables actually come in the form of this thing called contract assets. Correct. So That's right. That's right. receivables, the, the big difference is that uh, it's a bit technical, but basically... Uh, a receivable is when the company basically has already uh, they are, they are, they they are owed the cash really, basically they've already done the service and then that's it. It's just a question of time uh, as to whether they receive the cash. Now with contract assets, it's slightly different in that it's like a receivable, but because the contract between the EPC the ven- the vendor and the client uh, stipulated beforehand that if certain conditions are met then only the money will be released. Hmm. So, like if let's say if I sell a bunch of cakes, right, to a party and I give the cake, that's it. It's just a question of time whether the the, 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 the person who started the party will give me the money. Yeah. But with this one I built already, uh, that doesn't mean that I might get the money. I might get some of it. I might not get everything, right? I don't know if that makes sense to you. Yeah, it does. It's like it's like the cake. I mean, going back to the cake example you use. Let's just say the cake was meant for a five year old uh, yeah. girl's birthday party, right? And then in the contract, it stipulated that the cake needed to have fifty sprinkles on it. Yeah, you miss one sprinkle, it's forty eight sprinkles or two sprinkles. Yeah. In the contract, there's actually <laughs> space for them to say, "Oh, because you didn't put fifty sprinkles." Yeah. Uh, <laughs> You gotta, you're not gonna get paid but for the full cake. But you see, that's that's the interesting difference, right? Because if yeah. let's say let's say someone misses out a sprinkle, yeah, like, oh, okay, hold on, hold on, let me go get and get it here and put it on the sprinkle, yeah. right? But yeah. with EPC contracts, you forgot to put one uh, one <laughs> pipe. You forgot to <laughs> add more cement in this area. It's very hard to undo your your mistake, right? Correct, correct. So yeah. that that's where I want to go to the next uh, slide, which is valuations, right? To give a sense and. Why I think uh, K Power looks quite interesting is this, right? So if you look early on, right, they already have two billion of order books secured, and if the hit rate is let's say twenty five percent, so twenty five percent of four billion, uh, if you go back to the previous slide, the total bid is about four billion. So twenty five yeah. percent of that is about one billion. Yeah. So you can I wouldn't say safely assume, but it's reasonable to assume that they will get three billion over three to four years. So what I did was, let's say if it's at four years, we'd be conservative. So that's about seven hundred and fifty. Uh, wait, yeah, right, yeah, about seven hundred and fifty million a year in sales. Mm. And based on our research, obviously we can't share everything here because uh, it's gonna take a very long time. It but basically, into a podcast, man. <laughs> exactly. So like hydro, hydro, um, hydro or renewable kind of uh, uh. Or, or non like infrastructure kind of companies, especially the renewable hydro and all that, it's a lot. Uh, it's a higher margin, I believe. Like you can even touch ten percent. Yeah. But with um, EPCC, right, that drops down to maybe six to seven percent. So I say, hey, yeah. why not use a five percent, right? We so yep. conservative. And if you no, know, once I did the math, basically the PE comes out for PE, assuming they can collect cash and all that. Yeah. Uh, it's about eleven times. Whereas their competitors, like we talked about Perkat last week, we talked about some Maiden. I've not looked at the infrastructure players, but basically the yeah. renewable guys, they're trading at 40 and 50 times. Yeah. So premium. Uh, what I think I think what you're trying to say is that the other competitors are trading at a premium. Uh. That's the the message you're trying yeah, to say. Yeah, and, and and my question would be why are they trading at a premium when pretty much it's the same thing? Yeah. Right? They're doing the same uh job, basically. I'm not saying that, you know, this K Power SP should be at 40 or 50 or 30. Maybe it was, you know, just a couple of months ago. But uh, it looks very interesting. And, uh, you know, I will definitely keep an eye and learn more about the industry. 
yeah. uh, to see whether the E in the PE uh, is uh, justified in my in this quick valuation. <laughs> it's, it's tangible. The E is tangible. Yeah. So far, that's why that's why it makes this company quite interesting. Is that so far they managed to collect in 2020 10 million, 10 million in uh, operating cash flow. Mm. Now that doesn't sound like a lot, but when you compare it to their previous years, it's actually more than I believe the past ten years. I don't quote me on it, but when I did the math, basically it was that it it twenty twenty was a uh, was a pretty interesting year, pretty good year as well. So we'll see if they can repeat it, right? In twenty twenty one, they should have negative operating cash flow, I believe. But uh, going forward, who knows? Any yeah. final thoughts? No, I think uh, you sum it up pretty nicely. All right, next. If you are enjoying the video so far, remember to give it a like, comment anything you want to comment, uh, and of course, subscribe. Click on the notification bell, very important, so that you know when fresh updates uh, happen. Okay, guys, finally, we talk about CTOS, uh, probably the most anticipated IPO this year. Um, the backers of CTOS is the same one as uh, Mr. DIY, right? Creator, it's a private uh, equity firm. So now, uh, basically, uh, if you look at the article that I have on right now, it, you know, they want to raise about 1.2 billion, right? Uh, and the keyword here later I'll describe more is that 999 million will be coming from existing shareholders. And I'm going to mm. highlight why that's important. But before we begin, by the way, I think uh, on the 6th of July, which is uh, Tuesday, which is tomorrow, as of yeah. this filming date, is the last... <laughs> day for you to IPO. So when it comes out, ironically, you won't be able to IPO for it. So sorry, the timing is as such. You wouldn't but, be able to ballot for it. I think the word. Yeah, you wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to ballot for it. So yeah, so before we begin, John, what is uh, CTOS for those of us who do not understand? Yeah, it's a credit rating agency. And if you were to benchmark them against global peers, uh, you'd be looking at guys like S&P Global Ratings, Moody's, and Fitch. Now, to the retail consumer, most of the time, you wouldn't know. I think the way that we would describe it for a retail consumer would be when you go and borrow, uh, take a loan to buy your house, uh, to, to borrow to take, your, uh, to take a loan for your car, or um, I don't know, for some big ticket items where, where they need to verify whether you are able to pay it back. Credit uh, they worthy, actually, right? Yeah, credit worthiness. They refer to these uh, credit rating agencies. So there's two in Malaysia uh, that's very well known. One is Secris, the other one is CITOS. Uh, where it, get, it gets interesting is that CITOS doesn't necessarily just pull data from your normal uh, repayment sources like your banks, but they also grab data from even guys like the utility providers. So if you don't pay your Maxis bill or DG bill on time, they'll know. If you don't pay mm. your Tanaga bill or your gas bill on time, they would know. And that help, actually helps build a credit profile or credit score that it, it, it's actually a risk assessment, you know, to to the, the lender to know whether this, this guy will actually pay you back. Lah. I think that's how I describe the business. Yeah, and what's interesting is about, about them is that I think they have over 60% of the market in terms mm -hmm. of market share in Malaysia. And then the next best one, which is Experian, has yeah. I think something like 20%. Yeah. Uh, and they own about a quarter of Experian. Yeah. So, uh, you know, we were discussing earlier on that um, in, in the US, Moody's, S&P and Fitch controls 97% of the market. Yeah. Uh, this guy, you know, nearly 70% of the market is controlled by one, one, one person. One guy, yeah. Right, and you market. know, you, you know Experian, as you mentioned just now, MJ, uh, yeah. You remember our friend, Dr. Ye Kim Leng? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he was actually the chief economist at the the company that Experian actually acquired, which was Ram, Ram, Ram Holding, Ram C. Huh. Yeah, so, so you know, I was, I was researching, I said, hey, yeah, I remember Dr. Ye used to be with Ram. So when I went to check, yeah, that's how, that, that, that was the transition. Experian bought it in 20, October 2019, and they, they Ram C actually sold 33.15 to Experian. So in a way, it's almost... CITOS almost has a monopoly of, of yeah. the credit rating. In and that's why I would say that this is a one of a kind, right? So yeah. um, I was discussing yesterday with our research team about um, comparing CITOS and Mr. DIY. And mm. we were saying that CITOS might become like a DIY in, that, in terms of share price movement. And I actually think that it can even do better because, mm. uh, you know, Mr. DIY, you can actually 
kind of compete with them, right? If you have, if you're an entrepreneur and if you know a market well, you can actually compete with them. You can come up with yeah. better product. You can come up with guerrilla marketing. Maybe you go on Instagram and you are aggressive, right? Like the Dollar um, Shave Club kind of, you know? Yeah, remember? Dollar Shave Club. And anything where you can market your products on social media uh, is a competitive environment, right? Because the barriers to advertisement is very low. Correct. It's all about reach. It's all about creating good content and all that. With CTOS, you can't do that. Yeah. Even if you're a hungry guy, even if you have money backing you, it's going to be really difficult uh, for you to compete with CTOS because literally you are an institution. Yeah. Right? You need the law, law to, be back, uh, to be backing you. And that's one of the modes, uh, to put it bluntly, of uh, yeah. CTOS. Legitimacy and, mode. La. Correct. <laughs> it's, it's a legitimacy very... mode. It's probably yeah. the only company in Malaysia that I know of that has the legitimacy mode, which basically says that whatever they they turn their words into cash. Yeah. So the business model is they hire maybe an analyst or, you know, in modern times, maybe a programmer mm-hmm. to produce certain metrics and certain softwares. They pay maybe, I don't know, if it's a very good one, 150 or 200,000 ringgit a year or maybe higher. Then they, they are able to take his report or his analysis, let's say, and then sell it to a big company, they call it key accounts, right? Yeah. Uh, in their uh, IPO prospectus, these are complex clients. Uh, maybe they sell them for millions, right? So they pay one guy to a thousand, they sell it for millions. That's that's why the business model is very interesting. Yeah. But here, I think if you go onto the slide about uh, the ownership, yeah, right. That I think is uh, one thing shareholders need, potential shareholders or current shareholders need to take needs to be aware that. of. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Creator. Uh, through their through another company called uh, iNote or Enotes. iNotes. Enotes. BV. Yeah. 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 So yeah, iNotes. Um. Basically, they are selling nearly one billion ringgit worth of shares. Yeah. And reducing their stake from eighty to forty percent. Yeah. Now, uh, you know, I think this is a very very big, uh, move. Uh, if the company is great, why is it? that the shaving of the shares is so big. Yeah. I could be wrong, right? There's nothing wrong for them to catch up. But I think just think that you need to know this as a shareholder, that's number one. Then some people might counter my point and say, yes, even though they reduce it by half, they're still going to own about 40% uh, of the company, right? But, but one thing to note, I didn't put in the slides, is that the moratorium, which is basically the amount of time that they need to hold the shares after IPO. So for example, if you have a three-year moratorium, uh, means after IPO, you cannot sell your shares for three years. Think of it as a lock-in period. Lah. Yeah, it's lock-in period. Lock-in. Yeah. For, for this, according to the prospectus, Creator only has a moratorium of six months. <laughs> so basically, they can after six months, the remaining 40%, they can pie it down to zero. Uh, yeah, long to short. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So... If I'm in Kredo's position, if I want to maximize the returns, right, I already sold half my stakes for a billion. Let's say if uh, in the next six months after IPO, you know, it goes up uh, twice, let's say 100%, 200%, whatever it is, then uh, I will have a 3 billion stake, right? And you can imagine, uh, right, the number of ways they can actually gain from uh, this IPO. Yeah. So I think this is the first thing you want to think of. Now, the second one is a lot less shout about but very, very important. In fact, it's mentioned so briefly, it's literally one sentence in the prospectus. Correct, correct. But uh, thanks to our research team, we managed to pick it up. And that is actually uh, their interest in CB. I yeah. don't know if I'm even pronouncing it. CIBI. C-I- C- C-I-B-I. <laughs> C-I-B-I uh, was completely removed. So in their 2020 numbers, it was included. Basically, they are using the 2020 numbers for the IPO. And roughly about 5% of sales, which is Philippines based. Yeah. So one of the important things about this IPO as well is that they're going to allocate a big chunk, 25% to acquisitions. And I assume the acquisitions are going to, uh, you know, come from uh, overseas, right? Because um, that's where the growth is. Malaysia is still pretty good, but they already have a big market share. So there's not too much reinvestments into our acquisitions required in Malaysia. Now, why is this significant? It's because they're actually removing it from 2021 onwards. So if you're buying in as a shareholder, you're not going to be able to basically live off 
right? Live off this uh, sales or five yeah. percent. Yeah. And Philippines is the fastest growing. Correct. Is the fastest growing. So, uh, before I move on, John, what do you think of all this? I I think it's, in my personal opinion, uh, no right or wrong. Uh, I think it's a bit misleading when you include the numbers and then, then you put one line to say you exclude the numbers. Just just a one-liner. I mean, if you didn't read the prospectus in entirety and you didn't dive into the details, there's, uh, you have to do your adjustments uh, because the financial numbers have included this number. So there are three, a, a, any prospectus number you know, especially main board or ace board, you have to include your three, uh, the three years, uh, previous three years financial numbers. So you have to do adjustments on your own manually to exclude this Philippine entity and then come up with your valuations. Uh. So you have to be a little bit sharper. Uh. Uh, the, the second thing I think you've pointed out earlier, and I just want to anchor on that as well, is that Philippines is the fastest growing credit market uh, uh, in, in the region because uh, it's, it starts from a very, it's very simple. It starts from a very low base. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, I read somewhere that penetration for credit score in Malaysia is already about 77%. Yeah. So, so it's in a way almost reaching saturation point. We're not saying that the time is, is limited because... Credit, credit reports, right? you think of it, it's just recurring. You, you, you don't buy a credit report one time and use it forever. You know, Every time yeah. someone needs to do tra- that transaction, credit worthiness, uh, it's just a recurring revenue one. But what, what, we're, what I'm trying to say is that the saturation point is uh, reaching almost 200%. Like in the US, it's already 100, 102% saturation point, right? And Malaysia is 77. Philippines, if I'm not mistaken, is in the low 20s, uh, very, very yeah. low. And um, that, that's where the growth is. Uh, and I think it's a little bit sneaky of them to, to take it out. Uh. And uh, yeah. I think the money that they are ready to buy, the acquisition, they may be buying it back at a higher valuation uh, using shareholders' money. Uh. That's that's how I feel. Yeah, yeah, that is definitely a potential. We want to highlight some of these uh, you know, things you need to know. So if you go on to the slide about the potential, uh, actually what's also interesting is the fact that Malaysia spends very little per capita for credit reporting. Correct. So that's due to increase. So you don't just get the you don't just get the gains from the unit growth, which is the number of people getting credit reports. You also get yeah. the gains for per unit mm. how much they pay. Mm. So this is basically pricing power, right? It's like the yeah. m- number of milos you sell and then how much the price of milo goes up. So in Malaysia, the number of milos in this case or in this case credit reports you can sell is not decreasing but it's uh it's saturating 77 percent right but within that 71 percent if the price per credit report goes up then that's also another interesting uh win uh uh, tailwind right so whether or not we have the foreign uh i think you know is still gonna do well however if you look at ASEAN it's five times smaller yeah right so that's why if you know, going to uh, our last point, which is the last slide, which is about 63 PE, I yeah. think that such a valuation for an IPO only makes sense if they acquire uh, foreign companies within the ASEAN region. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah, right. Because that, that's where the, in a way, virgin market is. Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a, uh, yeah, exactly. So yeah. at the same time, we also see companies that are dominant, but not as dominant as uh, CITOS. IPO at a very high uh, PE, but then keep going up. So yeah. you're looking at Mr. DIY. Uh, this, sorry, this QL is not, did not IPO at a high PE, but today they are like 50, 60, and they are not the only ones doing Surimi. They're not the only ones doing uh, fish, uh, fish ball. They're not the only ones doing, um, what's the thing, eggs, right? Yeah. So CTOS, 63 p might look a lot, but if they truly grow at more than what they are now, which is 15%, uh, about 13%, yeah. I think 63 p might be slightly misleading, right? So any final thoughts on No, CTOS? I think uh, you you the conclusion I, I have is almost the same as yours. Look at the growth rate, uh, but also be aware that uh, when you're paying for this kind of valuations, uh, you have to monitor the growth. Uh, are they still matching that growth rate uh, to justify these high valuations? Uh? Right, okay. See you guys in the next uh, quick dive, I guess. See you. Bye.